Hey Techno Studs! One of the questions that I hope people are asking out there is why do we even have cryptocurrency? Because if we don't understand why we have cryptocurrency, then what's the point in investing in cryptocurrency? It needs to solve a problem. So first of all, let's talk about currency, the different types of currency there is, and what problems exist with, within some of the currencies that we have available to us, and what cryptocurrency sets out to solve with all of this. So let's jump into it. In this video, we're going to start out by talking about the functions of money, why money exists. Then we're going to get into different characteristics money has. We're going to talk about the different types of money that there is. We'll talk about the problem with fiat money, which is a type of money, one of the most prevalent that we have accessible to us. And then we'll finally wrap things up with talking about crypto and what crypto does to help solve some of these problems that regular currency has. Money has three main objectives, three main functions. One of them is medium of exchange, one is store of value, and one is unit of account. The medium of exchange means that I can exchange goods and services for money. Way back when, we just used to exchange services for services. So if you had some sort of service that you're providing and I had some sort of service that I was providing, we would exchange that. But the problem with that is you may not need the services that I'm offering or I may not need the services that you're offering. And so we can exchange money instead and then take that money and then use it for other vendors, other goods and other services. Uh, the next thing is the store of value, that some sort of guarantee or some sort of uh, the idea that that money is not going to diminish in value or at least not diminish greatly in value as I hold on to it. So I may hold on to that money so that way later on I can spend it. Maybe I'm saving up for something like a car or a house or something bigger and I need to store up that money before I spend it. So there's a store of value in that. And then the final thing that money sets to accomplish is unit of account. So think of this as the measuring stick. We measure against it. We measure how successful stocks or, or index funds or whatever is uh, we, we measure based off of, uh, of money. Uh, another example is even cryptocurrency. When we look at cryptocurrency, we most of the time measure it against other forms of cryptocurrency or other forms of dollars or yens or whatever uh, the currency is in your particular area. Area. So for here, it's US dollars. So we measure all of uh, a Bitcoin and these different altcoins off of US dollars. So that's a unit of measurement or unit of account. When we look at the effectiveness of currency or what we desire in currency, we really come down to like six characteristics that we really look for. One is, is it needs to be fungible. And the way I can describe fungible is like a $20 bill. If I were to exchange a $20 bill for a $20 bill that you had, then I would know that I have the same value. So we can exchange that versus something like a painting. If I give you a painting and you give me another, a, a different painting, I don't necessarily know that the value of those two objects are the same versus a $20 bill and a $20 bill are going to be the same. So is it, is, it, is it fungible? Another thing that we look for, is it, dura is it durable? Can I stick it in my pocket? Can I put it in my wallet? Can I put it in a purse? Can I put it, uh, can I exchange it? And how well does it hold up? Coins hold up better, paper bills not as well. Uh, so there are some durability concerns that we have when it comes to money. Then we have portable. D can I carry it with me or is it too heavy or is it too awkward to carry? Like a gold bar would be too heavy to just carry around on a day-to-day -day basis because it gets pretty heavy. So how portable is it? And then how divisible is it? Can I break it down? Can I break the 20 into 10, two tens, into four fives? Can I do 21s? Can I do uh, fractions of a dollar? So can I break it down? Is it divisible into smaller chunks? Then there's also a limited supply. 
And we see this, we'll talk more about this here in a second, but if it is just an abundant amount of supply and the government can just print more and more and more, then that creates a problem with that currency, with that money. And so there needs to be a limited supply of the money or currency that we're talking about. And then, it, is it acceptable? Can I can take it to other locations and do they accept it as a form of currency? So interesting, when I was over in Africa, I was able to exchange dollar bills over there. They were, were willing to do that, but I had a, a $2 bill. It was completely legal here in the States and it's a form of currency, but over there, they didn't really recognize that the $2 bill, it was very unique to them over there. So they thought that it was worthless over there, that, that they couldn't do anything with a $2 bill. So that's an example of it wasn't, that $2 bill was not acceptable over there. So that is what we're looking for when it comes to money. There are four main types of money. The first one is commodity based. And so commodity is a like gold or silver or some sort of resource that you're trading back and forth as a form of money. So gold coins is an example of that. Silver coins is an example of that. The US had copper uh, coins in the form of a penny. They had silver uh, in the form of quarters. They had nickel in the form of nickel. So there are different types of value that's associated with it because uh, the those um, had a material that it was made of. And so that's commodity. Uh, and exchanging gold is a good example of that, of that as well, gold bars. Then you have representative. So exchanging gold on the everyday streets became cumbersome and problematic. And so instead, what, what happened is in the US is they started representing it with dollar bills represented how much gold was stored at the bank and so or how much gold was stored at the at the reserve so you had representative money so representative money means that a dollar bill or a some sort of unit represents the commodity on the back end and uh, and so that's a representative type of money then you have fiat money. Fiat money is federal money, is going to be government money, government-backed money. So like the US dollar is an example of a fiat money. At one point in time, it was representative money. It represented gold on the back end, but in 1971, they switched it from representing gold to now it's its own entity. It's, a, it's, a, it's its own thing and it's backed by the government. So that's fiat money. And then we now more recently have digital or electronic money. Now, fiat money is one of the most exchanged, most used types of money that there is today. And so it's backed by some sort of federal agency, some sort of federal government. But there are problems with fiat money. There are times when a government is struggling to pay their bills and is very in debt. And so what they'll do is they'll start printing more money and it's a way to pay off their debt. The problem with this is it really sinks the economy and causes problems with the economy. In fact, the average lifespan of a fiat currency, of a fiat money, is 35 years. So we have a problem is, is that that's not a long time and it can cause a, a lot of problems and a lot of disruptions when you get something what's called hyperinflation because the government has issued or printed too much money. And I don't know if you recognize who this is supposed to be. If you've seen Breaking Bad, then you'll, I'm sure you'll recognize it. But this is actually me when I dressed up for Comic-Con, so I thought I'd throw that in there as well. Here's just a few examples from last year of countries that were experiencing some issues with hyperinflation. As you can see that there are some real uh, problems with this as your currency drops in value. Think of this as your, your the value of the money that you have is just dropping tremendously and you're not able to really do anything with uh, just a small amount of money. You have to have a huge amount of money to compensate for the issues that with hyperinflation. So that's where we see a lot of the problems with this fiat money. Cryptocurrency is based off of technology. 
a technology that we actually write code for, that we set up standards for, that we write out what exactly and how exactly we want that to respond. It gives us an opportunity to overcome some of the shortfalls of traditional money that has. And so we are able to reinvent how money looks like. And that's one of the big strong advantages of cryptocurrency, in addition that it's decentralized. And so we're gonna get into the pros and cons of what crypto has to offer, but this is just the idea behind this is it's taking away the power from any one single entity and decentralizing that power based off of a set, or, set of rules to compensate for some of the problems like hyperinflation. So what are some of those advantages of cryptocurrency? Well, we already mentioned, or at least briefly had mentioned, the decentralization and how it has some added advantages about taking away control from any central entity and decentralizes that. Uh, we also mentioned inflation and that there's some inflation protection that we can work into the rules when it comes to cryptocurrency. There's also a transaction speed. So when it comes to transactions, we can implement transactions possibly faster with cryptocurrency. There are some limitations with that, but there are also some big limitations when it comes to, like if you're transferring from one bank to another, or you're buying some sort of services and it need go, needs to go through those banks, that, that is a very big, uh, long process to get that money transferred and to, br to bring that out. And that can take days to do some of that work. Whereas cryptocurrency can be, uh, can be instantaneous or pretty close within minutes, and it could be really large sums of money within minutes. So it acts a little differently. There's also a cost effectiveness with the transactions. So your transactions uh, with, through your bank could be pretty steep if you're transferring money like from here to another country. Whereas if you have cryptocurrency, it's all the same. But there are some transaction costs when it comes to cryptocurrency, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then being transparent, the whole system is out there and transparent for all to see. The ledger is all transparent for all to see. For it's open for being a critical eye to make sure things are in checks and balances, where you don't necessarily get that with certain governments and with certain uh, agencies like banks and that type of thing. So there is there's a certain amount of transparency that happens with cryptocurrency.